and it features world issues, conceptual borders, and global supply chain management. Here with me, I am Dr. Sunday Adewale Olale. I'm going to be the moderator. And here with me, I have Dr. Manuel Suarez, Dr. Martin Larsen, and Engineer Juan Carlos. So, I would like to present uh, each of our speakers to the house. Here with me, I have Carlos. He has more than 18 years experience of collaboration, and he was um, a director of international affairs uh, between 2015 to 2019 in Udlap. Uh, he's an engineer in electronics and communication, and he had MBA in investment projects. Also, I have with me here, Dr. Martin Larsen. Uh, he bagged his PhD from uh, University of Manchester in social anthropology, and is presently in the Faculty of Anthropology and Multicultural Relations and specializes in business and organization anthropologies. He's a researcher and presently is working with a mobile app originated from Sweden for training the uh, footballers. I have with me also a professor by excellence, uh, Professor Suarez. Um, he's a professor of supply chain management. He's a researcher. He has more than 40 publications. He's a writer. He has more than eight books to his credit. And he recently won the award of case writing competition in the category of continuous improvement, the journey to excellence. And as I told you, I will be the moderator. My name is Sunday. I'm a researcher, I'm a teacher, and I'm a visiting professor uh, in Wood Lab here. I will now take you through the outline and the highlights of this webinar. We're going to have the objectives, the outcome world issues, conceptual borders, that we talk about global supply chain management, and we wrap up with question and answer. Our objective is to improve practicing managers' ability significantly and future managers to be efficient global managers also to discuss the effects of COVID-19. The outcome of the webinar, uh, participant of the webinar, we have the knowledge and skills to manage between the disadvantage and advantage experienced during a sudden uh, pandemic. Focus on self-development during the disruption of pandemic. Engage with the relevant contextual issues in cross-cultural management in relation to international business and multicultural global workforce. I will now give the floor to engineer Juan Carlos to open the floor as he discuss with us what issue related to COVID-19. Our argument here today is that COVID-19 has created a lot of uh, uh, commingle problems and it can only be tackled with commingle solutions. I give the floor to Engineer Carlos now. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Sunday, and thank you everyone for joining this session. Uh, my intention here today is to talk precisely about the sort of uh, issues related to COVID-19 uh, uh, all over the world, and more in particular in Latin America and, and Mexico. And uh, I would like to start with the fact that uh, uh, we all agree, or may agree with the fact that the only certain thing uh, that we have is the uh, extreme uncertainty on uh, the situation. And this, of course, causes a series of health uh, uh, issues, such as insomnia, some some people will have some uh, um, uh, eating disorders or uh, um, some anxiety or depression issues because uh, we are uh, receiving news from here and there everywhere saying a series of things. Some, some of them may sound more uh, uh, credible, some others may not so much. And the thing is, uh, this is causing a lot of mental and physical uh, issues for us. Um, 
also something that is affecting us as uh, in particular in Mexico because we're a Latin culture is the social distancing because we're very used to having this close interaction with people and be able to be close to them to uh, um, uh, do our daily things. And uh, this, of course, is causing uh, um, depression and, and anxiety for many people. Um, the economic situation is also uh, being severely affected and the educational uh, uh, issues that uh, uh, um, children and, and uh, university students are facing at this moment are uh, very evident. And uh, uh, this is becoming a um, fearful environment. Uh, people is living uh, with a constant state of uh, uh, paranoia and uh, uh, alert because uh, we're, uh, uh, again, uh, being invaded by a lot, by a lot of uh, uh, information coming from uh, many sources and we, uh, are no longer able to uh, know what to believe, okay? And uh, uh, another element that is affecting us is the pressure on the global economy. I think it's no secret for anyone that we're facing a recession that has not been seen in the world for the nine, uh, last uh, 90 uh, years. Uh, the last one that was uh, this uh, 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 terrible was uh, the crisis in the 1930s and probably the 1914s as well. Uh, and of course, uh, this recession is not directly related to COVID-19. It's a series of combined factors uh, uh, for all of us. And uh, the, the problem here is that it's affecting uh, uh, every single uh, human uh, being in, in the world. And uh, um, according to, for example, the um, Economic Commission uh, for Latin America and uh, the Caribbean, uh, the contraction for uh, Latin America and the Caribbean will, will be on average 5.3. Uh, um, some uh, countries will do a little bit better, some others will do a little bit worse. And actually the, the panorama for Mexico does not look any better because we may be seeing some uh, contraction of around 7% according to the latest indicators. So uh, this will be uh, very negative in terms of economic development in, in the following months. And uh, the effects are very evident, I think, uh, for all of us. Uh, we're starting to see for some people, for example, the reduction in their wages and fringes in the work. Some, some people is unfortunately losing their jobs, actually. Uh, the increase of debt, uh, uh, either at the individual level or the company level, because of course, uh, the productivity is uh, not uh, uh, working as it should. And of course, uh, there's a disruption in the global change uh, uh, supply chains, and uh, this is uh, uh, halting the economic activities in many industries. And uh, the government is also uh, uh, determining that some industries in particular should not uh, uh, continue working, and this uh, uh, has a direct impact on individuals and companies uh, at the same time. And uh, indicators backlash is uh, uh, something that is worrying a lot of people. The GDP and GMP uh, 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 is uh, uh, closely to zero at this moment for the majority of the countries in the world. Uh, there's an interruption in the value chains uh, all over the world, but in particular for Latin America, uh, it will be more evident for Brazil and Mexico, which are, uh, are being directly affected by, uh, for example, the price of commodities, which uh, are uh, in Mexico affecting us uh, in, the, in terms of oil prices. Um, it is expected to have a um, uh, export value uh, go back around 15% for all of us, and uh, employment drop will be around 11%. Actually, uh, I was uh, listening this morning that uh, Conneval was expecting around uh, five, uh, half a million uh, uh, employments lost in Mexico. And uh, in Europe, uh, it's around 50 million, uh, 59 million uh, employments uh, um, that may be lost uh, for these pandemics. And the climate change is also something that worries a lot of people. And although this uh, uh, suspension of uh, industrial activities is helping, it's not enough to uh, uh, counterfeit all the uh, uh, elements or the affection that the uh, pollution is doing at the global level. So we should be planning for survival at this moment. And I think the government has a, a key role in this uh, part and uh, uh, they should uh, implement a series of strategies to uh, make the economy go back uh, uh, to the new normal uh, uh, in the few in the following months. And uh, of, of course, uh, we as individuals, we sh uh, also should be aware of the series of things that we should be doing in terms of our economic uh, performance and development so that this uh, situation does not affect us further than it already has done uh, for the majority of the population. And of course, the third element is uh, the uh, participation of companies. How will companies do or uh, uh, implement the 
series of uh, actions and strategies to try to cope with this crisis and get out of it in, uh, uh, as soon as possible, of course. Um, this requires, of course, a, a, a major consideration of uh, what is called the crisis management, and I think some of my colleagues today will, have, will talk a, a little bit about that, and how uh, um, the top managerial positions in companies will have to uh, start thinking about how to, uh, for example, uh, well, well, the first element is to put the individuals first uh, instead of considering that the only objective of economy is uh, the growth of uh, the markets. Um, uh, and uh, have a clear communication with employees to uh, let uh, everyone know what's going on and how things will be in the future, and uh, have a series uh, of uh, elements. And, and But the most important thing, I think, would be to prepare for the unexpected. This is something that uh, my, per uh, my perception is uh, has not been considered before. Uh, and this, of course, requires a, a more clear uh, diversification of risks. Um, uh, companies usually had uh, uh, in mind the uh, economic risks or the political risks that could be involved in their uh, development and now we should be uh, more aware of the possibility of having a crisis that would stop the world uh, uh, because this is this is I'm pretty sure not the last time that we'll be seeing something like this I'm gonna stop here and I'm gonna leave my colleagues to discuss uh, also some some of this uh, uh, theme thank you thank you very much engineer Carlos and I call on dr. Martin Lassin to talk to us on the commingling of conceptual borders. You can have the floor now, Doc. Okay, thank you. Morning, everybody. So I'd like to start here in the municipality of Chikwasen, where I've been working with a cooperative of fishermen. And for those of you who have little contact with anthropology, this might seem like an odd starting point to discuss COVID-19 and globalization and international management. But from an anthropological perspective, uh, starting at this kind of apparently other places, uh, is defended as a way to not to be blinded by concepts that we have gotten too used to. So by looking elsewhere, uh, the idea is that you can get a fresh view on topics that we have in mind. So one basic lesson that these fishermen have taught me is that you should never take uh, your own concepts for granted. So I learned this uh, uh, through the, the way that they uh, consider economic development and concepts uh, such as politics and religion. And, and which I have been forced to, to reconsider. And with the, import, the appearance of the coronavirus, I also found myself posing similar questions about science, concept of science, politics, and business, which are the concepts that we'll be discussing today. So just as this outbreak began, one of the fishermen called me to ask me for my opinion on the coronavirus. So even if you know, I'm an anthropologist with no knowledge of epidemiology whatsoever, but uh, the reason uh, that he called him was that he had been hired by the government of his municipality to prevent infection and had been ordered to believe in the coronavirus and the seriousness of, of this problem. So, however, he, he had, anyways, he had doubts about this and if everything that the government said was true. But from, you, from what he told me, uh, it was kind of evident to me that he had framed this, these scientific recommendations through. Um, a particular understanding of politics uh, that I had come across when I worked there. So in the municipality of Chikwasen, politics is basically understood as something dirty, egoistic, uh, which they contrast with something with a morality that is based on ideas of reciprocity and, and equality. So this means that scientific recommendations that are communicated through state institutions are suspicious. Like, uh, and, and, and people believe that they're probably serving some obscure political interest. So in short, people are not really skeptical of science as such, but of the institutions that communicate its findings. So the result in this case was that uh, the scientific field had been politicized in a particular way, you could say. And at the same time, however, we can see that the opposite, how, how the political is being absorbed by a kind of uh, scientific uh, logic. So despite the common idea in Chikwasen that politics is something fundamentally immoral, there was at the same time the idea that politics should should ideally be open to device, diverse perspective, perspectives um, due to its emphasis on the search for what is right. So what happens with, when politics is absorbed by the scientific is that this search for the, what is right is replaced by a desire to distinguish between truth and falsehood. And uh, of course, there's no room for differences. Uh, there is, sorry, there is room for difference between scientists. And that's also been reflected in the measures that different countries have taken. In the case of doubts that my friend had in, in mind, 
uh, a more common reaction has been the type of orders that, that they gave him from governmental offices. So there's no space to explain the arguments behind recommendations or to take into account uh, local understandings of politics. So of course, I don't think that this uh, tennis is limited to Chikwasen. And uh, when we look at the whole world, like uh, to me, it seems like the whole world is dealing with the coronavirus much in the way, same way that, that, that they're doing in, in Chikwasen. So we have a sense of something scientific and global when we look at the, the following slide, um, where the whole world is represented uh, in sort of an objective language and where we have numbers uh, of transmissions and deaths. And so this uh, vision could possibly be corresponded institutionally by the World Health Organization, organization and its recommendation. At the same time, this very representation lets us see the uh, competition that is going on between countries. Um, where, where different political systems are linked to their effectiveness in their struggle against the viruses. That's the way that I see it, that's the way it's being understood. Uh, so much in the case, uh, much as in the case of Chikwasen, also here we have um, heard, you know, suspicions about the numbers that are, that are being reported or the past that are being chosen. So, uh, for example, you know, uh, does China or Turkey or other countries want to improve their numbers uh, and not report properly? And, uh, you know, should we uh, also just focus on effectiveness and, you know, uh, shouldn't we also be thinking about openness, freedom? So, so there's also sorts of, you know, political uh, discussions that are going into this uh, whole uh, crisis. So, um, so even if we change the perspectives from Chikwasen to an international arena, we can see that the coronavirus is about much more than science at the same time as different scientific arguments are used to defend political positions. What however does change when shifting perspective in this way is how a different kind of tension comes into play. So uh, I'm thinking of the one between global and the local. So in fact, I would say that uh, this tension has been central since the very idea of globalization started being used. Of course, there, are, there have been different, uh, there have been other ways to approach things that than to use you know, global and local. And I'm thinking, for example, an anthropologist Karen Ho, who worked for a, a Wall Street firm, and who tr tried to pin down this term global. What, what does it mean in practice? And she argued that it, is, it should be better understood as a way to sell investments and then to describe a reality where, where operations of a firm can, can, in fact, concern like a very small number of, of cities, such as you know, New York, London, and Hong Kong. But even this kind of ideas have important implications. So to think about the global, easily leads us to think that we can use the same kind of models independently of cultural context. So this of course goes both for states and international organizations and, and for companies. So with the coronavirus, uh, it seems as if the very idea of the global has suffered a severe blow. So the virus, uh, of course, would not have been able to spread as quickly as it has if it not worked for the tight international connections. But it seemed to be an advantage when discussing goods. Now it comes forth an obvious problem. So what we've seen uh, in, um, here is to turn away from the global, I would say, and, and towards the local, the national and the regional. And, so, and that is something that I think is quite clear in the following slide. So when we see the international trade is expected to drop considerably, uh, in the pessimistic scenario of the World Trade Organization that we're looking at here, it will de decrease with almost 40% in one year, which you know, uh, it's, it's massive. Um, and how we look after this is, of course, difficult to predict, but there might be reason to doubt even uh, the most pessimistic scenario. Uh, what we see right now is how countries close their borders, international uh, supply chains are being re reviewed, and regional alternatives suddenly appear as more attractive. So I'm thinking of um, Latin America, for example, uh, uh, where you have that, that kind of discussion going on. So maybe this tendency is not... Uh, as momentary as the WTO predicts, what we're facing might just well be an acceleration of a process that we have been seeing for a number of years already and which feeds into the tension between the global and the local. So while the critique of globalization has been, uh, has accompanied the concept since its birth, it became more widespread after the crisis in 2008. Some important stops on the road uh, that we can mention is of course Brexit and the election of Trump, uh, also the the election of uh, Lopez Obrador. So what I'm thinking is that what if the world of social distancing is not only health recommendation, but also reflection of a world that is splitting up. 
So while the future indeed is uncertain at this moment, I think that international managers might not only want to look through their supply chains uh, to prevent the kind of economic crisis that we're facing in the world that has been formed around the notion of globalization. They might also want to take into account how to relate to turn towards the local, the national, and the regional, and even how to relate to the particular understandings of politics and science that we might find in these different places. So thanks a lot. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Martin. I will now call on Professor Suarez to talk on global supply chain management uh, during COVID-19. Prof, you can have the floor now. Thank you, Professor Sunday. Good morning, everyone. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here with you in, in this webinar. I would like to start with, by defining what is a supply chain. It's a kind of support for our listening, listeners or for our audience. A supply chain is a set of process that generates the flow of material and information through different actors around the regional, local, country, or in around the world. This, this kind of actor could be a supplier, could be a distributor, could be a retailer. And in the traditional literature, for example, Fisher, claim like supply chain management can be efficient in, in order to optimize all the resources or can be in a quick response. This is a kind of supply chain that is focused more than in the pool system production that try to do, try to do anything that you want to do according to the customer requirements. So in that sense, what happened about in the world about the COVID-19? In the recent coronavirus crisis, outbreak came from Wuhan area. Everybody knows that. China and immediately impact Chinese export and drastically reduced the supplyability in the global supply chain. And this will be in the way that China is crisis. Most of the China supply chains can be temporarily broken and disrupted. It's a reality that supply chains need to become even more agile, adaptable, and aligning, like Professor Howley of Stanford University say. Because if you are not adaptable, in that reality, you will be die in the future. That is a very clear way. M Professor Martin Larson and Pro uh, Professor Juan Carlos Ley said uh, a few minutes ago that merchandise is, mar the merchandise trace is moving around, maybe in exponential, but in the future scenarios, we don't know what's going to happen. Maybe more optimistic, it will be decreasing, but we don't know what happened. So it's a reality that most of the supply chains are broken and disrupted temporarily now not just for China, only for also for Europe and also for South America. Mexico has a new reality and they have to make a big challenge to do that. For instance, in 99% of the Fortune 1000 companies have been reported seeing coronavirus driving supply chain disruption. That we see in the following slide, please. This is where we are results of we had to change most of the main variables that supply chain had, do we have in the management of our change. For example, one of the variables, it will be inventory management. Usually an inventory management, uh, safety store inventory management is around between 15 and 30 days. And now with the crisis, we change between 40 and 45 days, but this will become a very dangerous situation for all of our materials and goods. Why? Because it will be perdeceros, will be in the future with a problem. We will have to, have to maintain a lot of time this inventory in, in a storage way. This is a, this is a result of increasing, for example, the holding costs. If you increase the holding costs, most of the companies have now between 30 and 50% of the holding costs when, when they're regularly in a situation without a crisis, they have just between 10 and 15% of the holding costs. The same is has happening with the leak time, yeah? which has gone between from 30 to 45 days. And some cases I re has reported about 50 or 60 days. Um, perhaps two months is too much to have the, the products and the goods in a storage way because it's a possibility to have this problem and already come in before. Uh, in, another, in another situation and, and, and talk, thinking about, about that, organization, we have to think that some and other issues and some and other approaches that management related, for example, Kaizen philosophy, that means continuous improvement, as well, lean thinking, and are, even though artificial intelligence should be united issues more than ever that happened with the, that crisis. 
not only for operational efficiency, like Fisher said in the traditional literature, but also for integral healthy security for the workers. Uh, think, what I was thinking about last night is, is we can see an example, a simple example in any factory. Can you imagine an any worker what in, is not only cares about operating his process and his machine? Because one of the thinking is you have to be productivity, eliminate all the ways that you have already already the activity of the process. But at the same time, you have to be careful of any possible contagion of COVID-19. Devices, some devices like artificial intelligence could be helped for the worker. For example, the sensors, infrared, among others, can do operational work while he is a safer, safer for a station. Solution from all the three fields can be permanently integrating in the work process in organization. But we have to think, what about our workplace management now? And what about our supply chain management now? Because everything is changed, and in the future, well, we are in an uncertainty, uncertainty, very highly uncertainty. And this is a driving chaos. Try, try to drive in the chaos, because in the future, we don't know what is going to happen. Thank you. Thank you very much. Professor Suarez, uh, we want to expand uh, the argument of uh, COVID-19 commingling. And now I will call on uh, Engineer Carlos to give us more tips. Sure. Thank you so much, Doctor. Um, well, uh, as a um, way of concluding my uh, exposition, I would like to say that this situation, uh, uh, united to all of the uh, other elements that we're facing at this moment, uh, will give us an opportunity to reshape our society and ourselves uh, as a fact. Uh, we have to acquire a new mindset and uh, reconsider the things that we're doing in a way that they are uh, truly beneficial to our uh, personal and uh, um, um, group uh, development rather than just thinking about economic elements. Uh, I think it's time to uh, uh, restart thinking about being human beings again and be very conscious of the sort of actions and elements that are truly important into uh, development and uh, economic uh, growth. Uh, probably uh, we need to understand the need of this change. I think this was a good opportunity to uh, see how some things were not as uh, uh, necessary or vital as they uh, sounded before. And so this is a, a, a moment that we can think of other alternatives to uh, make an, uh, an overall growth of, uh, of ourselves as human beings. So we should be prioritizing our values and, and uh, um, consider the things that are really uh, helping us uh, develop, uh, developing and, and growing. And uh, also we've seen how this uh, overall uh, health of activities uh, had some uh, huge benefit in terms of uh, 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 global pollution and uh, probably take this opportunity to reconsider the sort of uh, actions that will help sustaining our uh, environment in, in the following years. We also may take this crisis as a tool to rebuild our future. Uh, I think it's important now to consider how, uh, how important it is to uh, interact with people and be more uh, uh, culturally intelligent in terms of how to uh, uh, interact with other cultures, how to understand and be empathetic with them. And, uh, uh, and this will help, of course, uh, uh, a better understanding of the needs uh, of everyone everywhere. Um, I think uh, the managers, yes? Thanks, okay. Oh, the managers and the uh, um, uh, leaders in, in companies should be uh, putting the priorities uh, in order and, and, and have new, new forms of leadership because uh, this, this uh, precise crisis has given us uh, the opportunity of see, seeing what sort of things should be done and in what moments. Uh, I think uh, we should be also considering uh, the, um, the life after COVID and how uh, the new normal, as uh, the government is saying, uh, should be a, a new standards of, of living. The, the type of social norms uh, that we should be following after these pandemics. And uh, um, I think it's also very important that we consider uh, the self-development and the acquisition of specific skills as part of our uh, uh, growth, because it's not only about going to school and learning what the lecturers have to say. It's only. It's also uh, about learning the sort of things that will help us uh, uh, making uh, 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 um, ourselves a better uh, human being. Uh, and of course, uh, this is also giving us an opportunity to reconsider what is going uh, to happen with the economy. 
should uh, uh, the, uh, uh, um, the companies still consider that the only uh, objective of uh, the economy is to grow in the markets or should actually the companies start thinking that the priority uh, in the world should be the development of uh, human beings. Yes. So we should be thinking of uh, 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 more socially just and sustainable futures and uh, this is going to change the uh, working and studying structures. Uh, I think we've seen how this is uh, modifying uh, how we're uh, working and how we're studying. And this is actually something very beneficial. And I would just like to finish with the uh, uh, element that uh, the globalization should also consider now the regional global economy, how uh, these areas in the world should be more closely interacting rather than uh, looking for alternatives on the other side of the world because the supply chain uh, uh, is now disrupted and this is causing serious uh, um, uh, economic uh, uh, consequences. So if we try to modify these patterns, I think uh, 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 this will give us better opportunities in the future to uh, grow as a society and as a better world. Thank you very much, Engineer Carlos. Before I call on the next speaker, please, if you have any question, try to drop your question on the chat box. Uh, we will take care of that after the webinar. I want to call on Professor Martin Larson to expand our thoughts on the future outlook of conceptual borders. Prof, you, you have the floor now. Thanks a lot, Sunday. So uh, as you have heard, we all agree that we right now live in a very uncertain moment where all truths are being questioned. So I think that's uh, from an anthropological perspective, uh, the way that I would frame this is as a kind of a liminal state. So this is a concept that we usually uh, use when we talk about kind of moments in between places. So it's a moment of, of uncertainty, basically. So normally we, we talk about this uh, uh, when for example, people get married or uh, a person like a, a girl becomes a woman. So this kind of ritual changes. So um, because this kind of liminal space, this, this, uh, this uncertainty is something that we normally try to, to avoid. And the way that we often do that, you know, when we can is through rituals. So um, and if we go back to the example of marriage, we have this space of doubt that is minimal. So you can never kind of erase it, but if you think of it, like there's a theoretical possibility that somebody can say no at the moment when you're supposed to kind of formalize this uh, transition from, from kind of an informal couple to a formal couple. Um, but so the question that I want to pose is what, we, what, what to do when we don't have this clear a path to follow and no script and no ritual around this that can help us. So uh, what I think that we have been seeing this far is how scientists in different parts of the world have, have started occupying, occupying a space of, of heroes. So in Mexico, this is evident, but the same goes for the United States, uh, Germany, uh, Sweden, they're all heroes right now. Um, so, and, and I do think that it is kind of a heroic act to, to try to move through the liminal space and try to say something about the next uh, step uh, that, of course, nobody can 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 be sure of. And, uh, but in that sense, I, I I do believe that we all have to be, you know, curious in that kind of sense that we try to have, have to try to figure out how to uh, face uh, the the specific challenges that the situation poses upon us, and and which does not have a clear solution. Um, so, uh, but the kind of heroic acts that I have in mind don't not necessarily have to be personal. Um, so, and I think, I mean, personally, I think that dialogue is, is crucial, that what we're doing right now, I think this, that is, can be really helpful. And, and um, also, you know, the possibility to change perspectives is, I think that is also really important. And of course, as I have, have tried to argue, we, we might even learn something from uh, places uh, such as Chico Sen that might not be fair, it's <laughs> like the most evident uh, places to start to understand the current situation. But um, as we can see in the, in the next slide, uh, what I want to propose uh, is that the current crisis can be seen as a liminal space where kind of discursive weaknesses become apparent and where conceptual borders are being questioned. Um, so I have focused on the relation between science and politics, where both fields seem to invade uh, uh, one another. Um, but I've also talked about the movement away from globalization and towards this social distancing where regions and nations become more important again. So I want to suggest that a result of this tension is that it has become much more difficult to claim that you know, science is science, politics and politics, and also you know, that business is business. So from my perspective, 
the globalization that we have gotten familiar to implied an attempt to keep these things apart. But in this area of social distancing, they're getting uh, commingled again without too much resistance. So one good example of this tendency, which is previous to the corona outbreak, is uh, the way that TMEC has expanded way beyond the commercial uh, concerns that guided NAFTA. Uh, so following this tendency, we might uh, expect that the obvious questions about how to reconfigure uh, supply chains uh, will need to be accompanied by consideration of political aspects uh, as something that cannot be even conceptually separated from commercial concerns. But this is, of course, also what uh, Juan Carlos and Manuel has been uh, stating, yeah. I, I believe. Um, so uh, following this, we might expect new discussions about independence of business in relation to the states where companies are registered, especially since many states will offer economic support to companies that have been struck by, by the current uh, crisis. Um, and uh, some of these tendencies that I'm drawing attention to might appear a bit evident, and you know, but it's, it's not uh, big news. I still think that it's important to keep in mind kind of the, the nature of the moment that we're in and that we have been stressing also throughout uh, this webinar. And, and I have described it as, as a liminal state here. So, so while it's uh, important to discuss how this next step might look like, like um, and, you know, that, that is something that, that we're all trying to do, um, we cannot get away from this uncertainty that, that characterizes this kind of situation. And, and uh, in fact, we could, could think that accepting this un, uh, uncertainty is kind of an important challenge at this moment. So I'm not here, like, I was thinking of, kind of passive contemplation, but, but kind of a reflexive action where, where we're able to keep different possible future open kind of simultaneously. Thanks. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Martin. I will now call on Professor Suarez uh, to talk to us on the way forward. Please, Prof, have the floor. Thank you, Professor Sunday. Uh, I was thinking that it is a strong light, a strong light in, in to study the world in the academic issues. For example, if you want to study the workplace every every day, it's difficult to see. But now with the COVID crisis, it's, it's more difficult to see now the world because the world is our world is going to change forever. Everybody had to know that, and this is a reality. When somebody said in the television or in the news, uh, we are going to come back to normally onto the reality, <laughs> it will be very difficult to see what is normal now because then this is the normal situation or the normal current situation in our daily work, it will be very different. And uh, that's why we have to think uh, that continuous improvement, uh, if guys in philosophy, will not simply to eliminate the ways for the, all the activities for the process or the Japanese called MUDA. It's not just that, because we have also take care about hell of all the workers in the organization. Uh, Five years ago, the Japanese academic tried to incorporate uh, the new variable about not just to eliminate the waste or about the productivity or operational efficiency. This new variable they call health safety, health safety variable. So now they are trying to incorporate in the daily world, but it's not a regular situation because all the business, like Martin said, is business is to business. You have to generate utilities and profit. Now the situation moved around this crisis to incorporate this health variable in the job, daily job. So as a matter of fact, health will have to be a key variable at work, such as productivity, as such as operational efficiency. And it must be a part of the continuous improvement of work using artificial intelligence, Kaizen and Lean Thinking. Also, I want to prompt uh, one question to everybody to want to understand. Are we going to work like usually we do before? We have to think about that because everything will be changed now. Thank you, Professor Sonde. Thank you very much, Professor Suarez. I'm going to take it off from there. Are we going to continue to work the way we have been working before? Uh, one key words in all the discussion is change, productivity, advancement, and we can't talk about this without talking about people, process, and technology. So COVID has come to change our lifestyle. It has come to change our thinking. It has come to change our relationship. 
our professor of anthropology is talking about social relationship in the context of politics, business, and uh, politics and, and, and business and the science. And we have to prepare for the change because the change has come. And if we are going to benefit maximally from the change, it means we need to follow all what the presenter have spoken about from the beginning of the webinar. We started with the world issues. We look at different continents and what is going on. And if you look at COVID itself, and you examine the statistics, you will discover that uh, the case confirmed and the recovery and the deaths, it is linear in progression. And if you look at it, the case confirmed is higher than the recovery. And the recovery is higher than the death rate. This is peculiar to different nations in different continents of the world. And that is a challenge. COVID-19 has created commingle problems. Problems of sudden deaths, problem of quarantine, problem of losing the loved one, breadwinners in the family, problem of failure, business are failing, problem of logistics, problem of socialization, problem of insecurity and uncertainty. Where should we go from here? If you look at one of the charts uh, of uh, Professor Martin, you will see that the optimistic scenario and pessimistic scenario is deep. And optimistic, uh, pessimistic scenario is deeper than the optimistic scenario. But if you look at the trend, the trend is linear. That is telling us yeah. that we need to change our lifestyle and we need to change our process and we need to change our technology. Is that we adopt a new technology or we integrate technologies in order to make things happen for us? Look at what Professor Suarez told us that we need lean, we need casing, and we need artificial intelligence. Also, we need Internet of Things to solve all the problems that COVID-19 has created. I will pause here as I will give the floor to Engineer Carlos for his final thought for us. Engineer, you can have the floor now. New normal and how to go work. We should start about uh, um, just uh, going to work by a big. Do we should be thinking about how work will fit us all in terms of uh, economic, personal, and and human development. Um, um, uh, it is a pro. Um, fifty percent of the companies can be automated with the, the name of uh, some some uh, uh, difficulties in terms of interaction with social, social distancing. I just said this morning that uh, I think it's uh, Twitter that uh, said that uh, their employees are free to decide if they should go back to work as the normal uh, uh, or they should uh, just uh, remain working uh, uh, in the home office structures. Uh, it's also important to, uh, for companies to be, for companies and, and governments to be very transparent on the information because this is that I believe uh, has been a major fail in, in this lack of transparency mm -hmm. and how uh, some information may be uh, misinterpreted or uh, and uh, having total transparency and, and communication in, in in firms and probably from the government, I think the trust can be rebuilt again, and this is something that we'll be seeing in the following uh, um, uh, months and years to come. And finally, um, uh, implementing strategy in companies. I think this sort of uh, that we uh, should be uh, now 
because uh, uh, it will be more important to rely on what can be done in this way and what would require the uh, human action. We will deal in uh, to computers in beef in innovate in, uh, um, in the possibility of considering uh, other elements. Uh, my my final contribution will be that to uh, move forward and start thinking of uh, um, a, a new strategy or new uh, a way of uh, behaving in terms of economic uh, uh, development, and uh, this requires again uh, the interaction, the deep interaction between the government, the industries, and uh, ourselves as individuals, because otherwise uh, uh, it will be much harder to get out of this entire crisis. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Engineer Carlos. I will now call on Professor Martin to give us uh, our final thought on this conceptual issue. Okay, thank you, Sunday. And uh, thanks, Juan Carlos and Manuel also. It's really nice hearing your, your, your talks also. Um, and uh, I think we're all kind of thinking of uh, new ways forward, what, what will happen and what to take into account. What I think is evident is, you know, how, how economy uh, is really, you know, it's a human activity. Humans are still involved, even if we can talk about, uh, you, know, I, I, you know, I work with this app, for example, and we can talk about artificial intelligence and uh, new technologies, but it's pretty evident that the economy rests on people going to work, you know, <laughs> doing stuff and not only at home. And, and so, uh, yeah, I think that's, that's kind of an important uh, starting point. Point. And uh, from my perspective, I think uh, it would be good also to think, I mean, there are kind of two things that I would uh, want to stress. On the one hand, uh, you can think about cultural understanding, and uh, I think that's something that you raise, which I think is really interesting, and, and uh, which I think we often tend to connect to international relations. So as if, you know, Mexican culture and German cultures, I think that, you know, maybe it would be good also to think, I mean, in, in, in Mexico, I don't, I don't know if we understand that well, you know, what, what people in Chicoacen think, you know, and, and they might be important, or people at their own company, you know, so that is something that uh, has been discussed very much in anthropology since the 1930s, when, when anthropology started being interested in, in large organizations. So you have uh, the formal organization that is not the same as the informal organization. So maybe think more also in terms of organizational culture, you know, and, and what you want to do with, with the company in those terms. What, what kind of, uh, uh, Carlos was talking about trust, I think that that's uh, really important and kind of think long term there. And what, I mean, uh, this example of my friend who got an order to believe in something. I mean, <laughs> you can't order somebody to believe in, in something. I mean, that doesn't make sense, but it talks about a lack of kind of, um, you know, a trust, of course, but a lack of, 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 of trustful kind of relations over time. So uh, I think that's a good lesson also. I mean, for countries, of course, and uh, I think that's crucial, but also uh, for companies, I would say. So, and maybe kind of move also beyond then, uh, um, I mean, of course, from an anthropology perspective, we're, we're not that uh, into statistics. Uh, I mean, we don't produce that a lot, even if we can use it. And so, um, yeah, maybe, uh, I mean, Juan Carlos was also talking about the importance of the human beings. So I guess that's also one of the reasons why I put a photo on human beings, you know, also in my presentation and not just, you know, uh, abstract numbers, which of course are also important. But in the end, it goes back to, uh, you know, people such as these fishermen or, you know, workers or whatever you have. So, yeah, that would be my uh, final comment. So thanks a lot. Thank you very much, Professor Martin. I will now call on Professor Suarez uh, to give us uh, a tips to take home. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Juan Carlos. Professor Martin, it's also a pleasure to listen to us because uh, you inspire some new way of thinking and also also some new research lines because it's very interesting to, to have this kind of debate together. Uh, I was thinking, uh, uh, listening to you, that the improvement, the improvement is the missing element in the organization. It's not just for the COVID crisis, but now with the COVID crisis, we had to rethink about the improvement issues in the daily workplace. Because improvement could, could be, an improvement also sometimes innovation, could be the possible key solution in order to rethink the strategy, workplace management, and of course, productivity in the, work, in the workplace. Because uh, if you don't think in improvement, 
your company will be die. But now in the crisis, is now it's increased a lot because this regularity that I already said before, is will be non normal again. It will be non normal again. So I, I was thinking in this situation because we had to res rescue the improvement issues in all the world of everybody, because improvement will be the only way to increase our possibility of to change our status quo. Now, not just for the productivity, operational efficiency, or to eliminate the waste, but also for the healthy variable. So uh, this, uh, this reflection came to my mind and, uh, and bring a lot of the butterfly inside of my mind because you, you think every day, every day how we're going to do at the same time. Even, now, even though we are a professor, or we, are no, we are a researcher, but we are also workers. How we're going to deal with that one of the key solutions can be improvement and innovation. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Suarez, for that wonderful tips, innovation and improvements. And when we don't have that, and that sees in our daily activities, then it means we don't exist anymore. In as much we exist, we need to keep on improving and we need to keep on innovating. I want to wrap, wrap up all what we have discussed in these notes. Uh, we need change management. Yeah. We need change management. And if we are going to have a success in change management, we need people that will comply to the rules and regulation of every institution. Also, we need artificial yeah. intelligence because it's an intelligent machine that can solve some problem that we cannot solve ordinarily. Also, we need emotional intelligence because our emotion has been tampered with either at the organization level or at the family level or at the institution level, like tertiary institution, like university. So we need to rebuild our emotion and we can get through it through emotional intelligence. Also, we need cultural intelligence. COVID has uh, led to a lot of cultural clashes across the borders. So we need cultural intelligence to mend all the gap in our cultural interaction. And we can see also in Mexico that our culture has been tampered with with, with COVID-19. When I came to Mexico, one thing I noticed, I noticed side kiss. That is a culture here, and people do it, but we've stopped it for some time now. How do we bring it back? It will take some effort. So we need cultural intelligence. And I want to talk about big data. This COVID-19 has generated a lot of big data for organization, for nation, for institution. And what do we do with this data? Data is the next oil for every country. And we need to look into this data that COVID-19 has generated big data. And we try to work on them through machine learning, deep learning. Uh, we begin to bring insight from them. And with all this, we should be able to move our organization back to the former state. It may take time, it may take effort, but if we are tenacious about it, we shall surely accomplish it. And the question that unites us together here today is, where do we start from here? How do we go about it? When, how, and why? I hope this webinar has provided uh, provide questions to some of these uh, uh, questions that have been running through our mind for days, for months now. And I'm very sure that by the time we ruminate over this webinar, we'll be able to take our organization, our institution, our family, and our personal life. One of the presenters talk about personal development. It's part of the change. We need to develop ourselves to get to the next level. I hope this webinar will make great impact in all our life endeavors. I want to appreciate the audience patience and how you are patiently
comply with the rules of the webinar and follow through. We are now going to the session of question and answer. If you have not typed your question, and if you are not comfortable with English, uh, maybe our, our, our Spanish professor will help us. Uh, maybe you can type your question uh, in Spanish so that our Spanish professor can give attention to you. I'm trying to see a message here. That's a question here. Do you consider that true workers' wages will be affected both in home office and in production and services? And I call on engineer Carlos to open the floor uh, to this question. Thank you. Well, uh, yes, I believe uh, the, the um, ranges and benefits for workers will be somehow uh, modified in the future. Uh, but this is um, this may sound prejudicial at the very beginning, I think, because uh, no one would be very comfortable with having their uh, uh, social or economic structure modified from one day to the other. But I think this would also be a, an opportunity to be, uh, I would say, more fair in what uh, uh, each per individual should make out of their uh, um, professional activities. I think this has uh, shown that there are some uh, specific uh, positions that are vital to, to um, our uh, development and for example uh, medicine of course which is uh, at this moment one of the most uh, uh, logical uh, uh, positions that should be uh, better addressed in the future but I think there are some other positions that uh, also uh, were not uh, very well considered before and it would be a very good opportunity to start reconsidering how to compensate to truly compensate the work that each one of us is doing uh, to contribute for uh, a human development I think uh, uh, it will be a, a an opportunity opportunity for all of us and for companies and probably governments to start thinking on how to be more adequate or more fair uh, uh, to the um, uh, compensation that each one of us should receive uh, for uh, uh, our uh, activities. Uh, as I said, it may not be uh, necessarily uh, uh, well received at the beginning, but I think in the, in the future this will be a, a, a better uh, um, opportunity to distribute better the resources. Uh, home office, of course, I think uh, uh, is something that was already done uh, very, very widely in some other countries, but in particular, I, I believe that in Mexico was not what that is spread, only some certain companies had this opportunity. And now we've seen that we are very capable of doing uh, a lot of our activities uh, in our own uh, works of uh, homes. I know that uh, there are some, some specific professions, for example, uh, laboratories that, uh, of course, it's impossible to work at home, but some others will find new alternatives of doing things on their own, and, and this will be beneficial in all matters because it will also allow us to better distribute our time. I think, uh, in, uh, and this is a personal perception, that we were very used to having uh, our second life at the home office, at the office, I mean, and then coming back to uh, um, sleep at our homes, and that was pretty much it. It let, let, uh, allowed uh, very little space for additional activities. And now we're seeing that it will be possible to distribute better our time so we can uh, cope with our professional activities, uh, uh, probably educational activities, and home activities. We have some more time to interact with our families, and this is, I believe, something beneficial. So uh, I think the possibility of home office as an alternative in, in our daily lives will be truly beneficial in the near future. Thank you very much, Engineer Carlos. I will call on uh, Professor Martin to give us an uh, anthropology perspective to this question. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Thanks, representative of a whole discipline here. But um, yeah, I mean, already in the question, you're, you're uh, dividing things, uh, uh, you know, production services and so forth. And so uh, I think that's uh, something that's happening in restructuring of, of markets. Uh, one sector that I've been working a lot with is tourism in Chiapas. I also work uh, with this um, uh, company that gave uh, give tours in, in the river there. And, and uh, I mean, the last uh, crisis in 2008, you saw some uh, pretty important changes there. There were uh, kind of big political plans to open up um, you know, uh, new tourist attractions in, in Chiapas. And, and uh, they started up with... Uh, this uh, park is kind of a nature park in 2000 or something called Amiku. So uh, they had lions and stuff like that. Tigers, sorry, lions didn't have that. But this is whole, this massive investment. And, 
it just fell apart in, after 2008. So I would guess you, you would definitely have that kind of uh, uh, outcomes also where, where, you know, initiatives will fall apart and you cannot recover. Uh, but okay, so, but to, go, to go back to workers' wages, of course, I mean, uh, that has an impact directly on workers and, and uh, who will, will not be able to work there anymore. And, and uh, the boatmen that I'm working with, they're, they're really struggling now. So they're getting, I think it's like 500 pesos, uh, it's like, like 1,000 pesos per month now, because they're not working. And I mean, 1,000 pesos, it's, it's uh, I mean, they're, they're really, really stressed. Yeah. And uh, there's also, I mean, to link to what I was talking about before with uh, political considerations and uh, so forth. I mean, uh, it's not a surprise that you can see a lot of skepticism uh, against, you know, scientific uh, recommendations, you know, stay inside and all of this. And, and you have all sorts of ideas about what's, what's happening there. So maybe I'm drifting off here into, but I would say, yeah, I mean, definitely has, it already has a, a huge impact on, at least, you know, with people that I work with, they're seeing it already and they're really worried about the future. And, and I mean, there, there are good reasons to be so in, in certain uh, sectors, so yeah. Thank you very much, Professor Martin. I will now call on Professor Suarez uh, to give us uh, the torch of supply chain. Oh, thank you. Uh, um, I will, I will, I will answer the questions of Enrique and maybe one uh, of a possible answer to the Spencer also that they, they make a very good questions. But I will make a, a continuous improvement perspective because we have to rescue the concept of value adding in the work. For example, if you want to change the situation, if you are in a present job or a home office job, yeah, what the most important thing is the most value adding activities you do, you do for the company. That is the most important thing that we have to rescue in, in, the, in, our, in our daily work, in our, in our daily work. Because if you, you think in the future of work that Spencer said about the nature of the contracts, and it will be more informal or home office, I think you have to be looking for the process where you do activities as the process that what you're doing. And then these activities, what is the more value added activities for the company and for you and to make an alignment for that. Because if you make an alignment for that, the strategic objectives of the company will be accomplished every day when you do activities that get value added for the company. So, so this is, could be a new rethink of the work because if you were making a contract for a one person, it will be not a, con a contract of long term or maybe short term. Maybe it will be a contract for value added activities that you do every day. So that, that will be a, a key point that we have to rescue because uh, in the... Japanese management philosophy of Kaizen, they are thinking about many years ago about this situation. For example, Taishi Ogno, the father of Toyota production system, he always claimed about that. Looking for the value added activity, value added activity. Now in the COVID crisis, we have to rethink this situation because if we're looking for this kind of activities, maybe, maybe it could be a link or could be a strong bridge between the contract and we are going to do as a daily work. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Suarez. Uh, professor has uh, answered the first and the second question together. And I call on engineer uh, Carlos to respond to Spencer's question on contracts. Thank you. Well, I, I think um, I, I agree uh, pretty much with Dr. Manuel uh, in, in these elements. And I think uh, what I would add up, um, maybe somehow would answer to the uh, question made out by the uh, made by Spencer and by Jose Luis Escalona. Uh, what are the opportunities here? Uh, um, I think uh, for many years we have been struggling with uh, the uh, unfair distribution of, uh, of uh, um, income and I think uh, this is a very good opportunity to rethink and to uh, uh, once again place humans as the first priority of uh, economy. Rather than thinking about the markets uh, uh, themselves, we should be thinking about how to adequately uh, um, compensate everyone for the sort of activities that they do. And that the concept of value added that Dr. Manuel mentioned is very, very important because uh, um, I think, as I mentioned uh, before, many of the activities that uh, we are doing could be somewhat automated by some of the technologies that we already have uh, in place. 
uh, I think in, uh, artificial intelligence, Internet of Things, and uh, many other things can can uh, help uh, uh, the development of our activities uh, without problems. But uh, I think uh, it is important to consider, uh, of course, the possibility of uh, uh, having human beings more focused on being inventive, on being creative, and, and doing the sort of things, for example, relationships with uh, one another, uh, um, and, and um, make uh, an overall growth of our economies. Uh, I think uh, uh, that would uh, be uh, what I would have to say in terms of uh, uh, the welfare distribution for everyone. Thank you very much, Engineer Carlos. Um, uh, everything is still bordering uh, on the way we position ourselves during this crisis. Uh, there is human resource accounting, that is, the company wants to know the worth of each worker uh, in monetary terms. And if you are not a worker that can add value to your organization, wherever there is crisis, you will be the first target. And that is why we need self-development. We need to improve ourselves, as Professor has told us, and we need to get ready for any uncertainty, either on job or in family or in the society. I will now call on uh, Professor Martin uh, if you have any response for Spencer. Thank you. Oh, Spencer, Spencer. Oh. Sorry. oh, sorry. I was I was thinking about the question that Jose Luis Escalona was posing. And uh, that is okay. You can say that also. We, we should uh, go okay. to the Damian. Yeah, Damian. Yeah, also. No. Sorry. Um, sorry. Just um, Damian. Do you think that some groups for people to adapt to pandemic or the money? Okay. Oh, Difficult question. <laughs> yeah, it's, yeah it's, it's, um, well, with the, so I, I would like to start with the question that is posed by Jose Luis Escalona, which is saying, you know, what is really new in this historical momentum since we have been discussing welfare for workers for decades without yeah. a reliable solution? So I think uh, for me, that's a really interesting question. And I guess that the big difference is that we have a crisis now. And, and of course, uh, you can expect things to change. Of course, you have different, uh, uh, you have uh, kind of political struggles, of course, uh, that, that will try to promote different agendas in different ways forward. That's, that's kind of natural, but uh, something that can come out of, of, of this kind of crisis. I, I mean, I can't think of, of um, another moment that has, uh, has you know, uh, had the, the possibilities that this one has to kind of Rearrange things. I mean, things are already rearranging. So uh, maybe, maybe that, that would be kind of an idea about that. Um, and about informal work, uh, I mean, um, I, again, where I've been working, this kind of informal work all over. So uh, uh, maybe that's not the best uh, space to start because you have, uh, um, yeah, it, it's not where you have kind of uh, uh, those kind of issues. Uh, necessarily but yeah I mean that that sounds like a plausible idea that, that more people would go into informal labor and, um, yeah so I don't have much very much either sorry thank you very much professor Martin uh, for the issue of the welfare is not peculiar to a particular region or continent uh, it is intercontinental issue that uh, employer will promise and they will not fulfill their promise I think uh, in many organizations and in many countries, they have um, workers union, uh, the people that are representing the interests of the workers. But so many times it results to crisis. The issue is that we need a change in every aspect of life, including the management of an organization, including human resource uh, development, uh, we need a change that people will begin to see women as women, not a machine that I can use and dump. The, work, the, the employer will begin to see their workers as resourceful, resourceful uh, tools in the organization that can turn their life around. One entrepreneur said that if I lost all and I have my workers, I will rise again. So if each organization can see things like that, welfare issue will not be a problem. 
the more you take care of your workers, the better for you in the organization. So what we are still talking about today is issue of welfare also need commingle solutions. And we can take it from the accounting perspective. We can take it from human resource perspective. We can take it uh, from country policy perspective. And we can keep on talking about it on and on. If there's no change, nothing will happen. So to answer your question is the management, the policy makers, they also need change in human resources policies. Thank you. We look at the next question. Do you think that some groups of people to be adapted to the pandemic or they manipulate it? So Domin, Damian is asking if they manipulate um, uh, COVID-19. Anthony Carlos, can you give us any tips on this? Well, just as uh, Martin said uh, a few minutes ago, this is a very uh, complicated question to answer because uh, uh, it is uh, um, rather impossible to say, in my opinion, uh, to what extent is this information from the uh, uh, entire crisis uh, manipulated or hidden from the public. And that is why I talked about the transparency in, in information. Just as you, Dr. Sande said, I think uh, data will become the new oil and uh, um, some people will have better access to information, of course, and this is something that they will uh, uh, always take advantage of. So um, there may be groups of, uh, of people that will have better access to this information and for this reason will have better opportunities of uh, reacting to, to the situation. But I think... Uh, um, uh, eventually, uh, uh, things should be more clear for everyone and we should be able to take better decisions based on, on uh, solid information and uh, how this will affect us uh, individually and uh, as, a, uh, as a group as well. Thank you very much, Engineer Carlos. Actually, conspiracy theory is the order of the day. <laughs> yeah. and, uh, many people said it's, it is from China, it is through 5G, and it is from this, it is from that. But if we look at it critically, we we'll discover that uh, either somebody must man must amended it or not, we are having the it on ourselves as an individual. And we are having the impact. You know, I work around the university, but I cannot enter the University of America. This is the university that I can open, I can enter uh, for a few weeks back or a few months back. So the, the reality of the matter is that we are seeing the reality of COVID-19 in every facet of status and in every aspect of our life. So I will not agree that it is some set of people that ma mastermanded it. So I will count this rather to be political issue. Maybe Professor Martin will give us some tips in the political world. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, well, I was thinking, you know, uh as I was saying about the political struggles that are ongoing. So, I mean, uh, it's not just one organization that gives information and uh, they also get information from different actors. And uh, Manu Suarez was talking about war, right? Like, is that what's going to happen in their head also? So, I mean, you definitely have, when you have competition between countries, there are uh, activities always that will be involved that try to uh, make people believe, uh, you know, uh, to try to misinform people. So, so, and it's very difficult, of course, to navigate in, in all that, as you were saying, like, that's what we're surrounded by all the time. So how, the, all this issue of trust is, of course, extremely important in, in situations of crisis. And that's not something that you can build up right now, you know, and, and that's why you have to think ahead. And, uh, but yeah, that, that, that would be my, my answer. I mean, it is really difficult. And actually, you know, this friend that called me and, you know, should I believe everything that I hear is like, uh, well, Take care, you know, that's the only thing I could say, because what, what should I say? I mean, every, every uh, situation, it's very difficult, of course, you know, uh, exactly what, what is behind, you know, political interests and also the different interpretations of what you should do and how, as I said before, kind of what, what, what I'm a bit worried about is how, how um, scientific language is being used also in political discussions and, and comes forth as the only truth and you, you can't negotiate that. I, and that's not true for science. So, I mean, I can't understand why it should be true all of a sudden in, in kind of public life. But of course, I understand also preoccupations, you know, when you have uh, this context of conflict and, and active attempts to disinform people. So, 
I mean, yeah, again, it's a, a very complicated uh, uh, situation, but I would, I would say, as you were, you were also saying, Juan Carlos or, and, and uh, Sandy also, you know, I would doubt that there's kind of this conspiracy, uh, one group of powerful people sitting at, you know, uh, some closed uh, resort somewhere and making up, you know, the, the, the destiny of, of the world. I mean, that, that, uh, no, no. <laughs> so, uh, but yeah, but you definitely have political conflicts going on, that, that's for sure. Thank you very much, Professor Martin. Uh, I want Professor Suarez to help us re respond to the question of AFRS. How impact the artificial intelligence development in the number of manufacturing jobs? With this, how can be the human being be considered as priority? Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, Professor Sondin. A very good question, Rodolfo. Uh, if you think about uh, Frederick Taylor and the beginning of 20th 20, 20 century, Taylor uh, the father of uh, scientific management, he always said that uh, the human being, I mean the workers, is like a robot. Yeah. They don't have to think. Yeah, they have to follow the instructions. So if we think in that, in with that, we are working still in some companies like have this kind of model. This, this kind of model, uh, one of the main authors say that we call bureaucratic mechanistic model of organizations. And in this kind of organizations, yeah, uh, that like Taylor said, uh, Max Weber said in 1922, this, the worker is a kind of robot that just follow the instruction for the gods. Yeah, the engineering gods. I, also an engineer, yeah, but I want to say that. But uh, That's the very interesting point because in artificial intelligence, we have to relate whether the human being is the key and the heart of the process. So you cannot delay it. You cannot delete, I'm sorry, you cannot delete the human being and the worker because the human workers always have to think in order to drive the process, in order to drive the process and to maintain the process. Wherever you have a robot over there to make in the job or wherever you have a sensor over there to make in your, your job more health, more safety and more, more productivity, you always have the heart of the process that will be the human being, that will be the thinking about that you are the heart and you will be the, the person that you always think how to solve the problems every day. So this is, will be an, one of the main points. Artificial intelligence don't want to raise the people. Artificial intelligence want to help the people in order to do the process more productivity and now more safety. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Suarez. Uh, I know uh, we have an engineer, engineer Carlos, and he's inclined into technology. Well, what can you tell uh, AFRS uh, regarding this question? Well, I agree uh, very much with what uh, Dr. Suarez mentioned. Uh, uh, I think this is the very same situation that uh, human uh, beings uh, faced with the Industrial Revolution. They thought that with the introduction of machines, uh, they would be some, somehow uh, uh, displaced uh, and no longer be useful. This is absolutely false. I think uh, we should be uh, considering uh, uh, artificial intelligence and technology itself as a tool to work with. Uh, um, of course, we are in uh, absolute disadvantage when we're thinking about making calculations and using big data as human beings because we cannot uh, uh, do that on an a, a easy way. That is why machines can help us uh, with that. But uh, we as human beings are uh, vital and elemental in, in all sort of activities uh, um, to uh, make things work because uh, um, there are so many things that machines cannot still do uh, and uh, the adequate reasoning for finding solutions and answers, alternatives to uh, uh, solve situations are of course things that uh, are still uh, um, all allocated or allocated for human beings rather than machines. Of course, uh, uh, computers uh, can process all the information and the data that is coming from, for example, this uh, COVID-19, but there's someone that will have to uh, make the proper analysis and take the uh, decisions to what to do uh, uh, with this information. So uh, um, my perception is that we should consider technology as a tool to work with uh, and to uh, benefit our lives instead of threatening them. So uh, this is the way I see it. Uh, um, we should consider this as a, um, a helping hand instead of a threat. Thank you very much, Engineer Carlos. I will quickly go to Professor Martin. This question is about social distancing. Uh, to respond to DPS, do you think that workers in the artistic sector, for example, musicians, will survive despite social distancing? 
how would they be able to restructure their activity in the future? No, come on. Thank you. Yeah, well, uh, I think, I mean, uh, there are different activities that you can move online and those are, uh, you know, the, the ones that uh, ha have uh, the best opportunities, I think, at the moment to survive, of course. I mean, for us, it wasn't a big deal to move online as, uh, I, I don't know, speaking from my own uh, perspective, maybe, I don't know. But to, to move online and to teach online, it's not like, a, you know, it's, it's, it's not the same as the boatman that I was talking to. And, uh, and musicians, I mean, I, I, I personally have different apps of uh, the, the, the Metropolitan and so forth that you can go and listen to the opera or whatever you're interested in. And uh, so, uh, yeah, I mean, and I've also seen like small theater groups actually kind of posting things on, on YouTube and, and reaching an audience. So, uh, uh, yeah, I, I wouldn't say that that's so complicated. The, the, the most complicated things are, of course, where you need physical contact. So that's, the, that's, uh, that's key here. So I'm almost thinking of uh, the football team that I'm also uh, kind of linked to through this app. Um, I mean, you can't have an audience right now and they depend on their income, you know. So from having 25 people to not have any audience is a disaster. So, so that, I mean, that's much more difficult, you know. I mean, you can broadcast that, but it's, and well, maybe it's the same like a musician. I mean, it's not the same thing to watch it online as to, to uh, be there as an experience, but maybe there are kind of more corporeal experiences. I would say the football or soccer is one of, one of them. I mean, it's not the same thing to watch TV than to, to be there, I guess. So, um, yeah, I would, I would personally, I mean, I, I, I would personally also think that a lot of people listen more to music when you're at home and kind of working and stuff like that. So maybe I, 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 it's not the, the industry that I would have in mind, like, uh, in, like first in line of, of economic problems, but maybe, um, yeah, maybe, maybe, maybe I'm wrong. You know. Thank you very much, Professor Martin. Because of our time, uh, we may likely uh, stop with the EG question, and I will call Professor Suarez to help us to attend to this question. Just drop in by personal opinion, all business model will have to be completely retouched are invented to attack to this new global reality. Companies like airlines, for example, many of the flights are taken by business people who attend meetings around the world or locally. And I will now realize that distances can be reduced and easily within the reach. Companies are going to reconsider how relevant it is to be physically there now that they have realized how technological tools can effectively shorten and streamline meetings in different parts of the world with the use of these tools. Thank you, Prof. Uh, interesting question is uh, to understand because uh, if we think about what happened with the airlines, most of the airlines uh, announced that they are going to change their, their, their layouts. They, this is very sure. We are, they are going to change the layouts. I think they are going to reduce the six they are having to put up barriers inside of the six because uh, everybody had to fly sometimes for the physical meetings, but we had to reduce everything. This is one of the answers with the possibility. That this is not a, a, an assumption that we already made. It's a reality they are going to do. They are going to do because this is a new reality without a vaccine now in the world. We had to travel like this with all safety, uh, I mean, uh, devices we were going to have inside of the airplanes. What, this is one of the issues. And another issue is that it, it had to be uh, the AG said about companies are going to reconsider how to relevant is to be physical, physical there. I was thinking in what is, is, is an efficient meeting. Most of, most of the academics issues, most of the academics issues and most of the academic knowledge about that, they say that one academic, one, one efficient meeting is just for fifth minutes. More than 50 minutes, nobody listen to you. So uh, it will is without you have uh, a situation online or on presence. We have to look in for a uh, effective and efficient meeting. That's, that's a, that's a, will be a good point, and this is, will be a good strategy that you do have to consider in, in your management system. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Suarez. This is a global phenomenon. Uh, did uh, Engineer Carlos have something to tell us? 
Well, I, I would just uh, add uh, to what Dr. Manuel and uh, uh, what uh, Dr. Martin said, that there are many possibilities of rethinking how the economic activities for some professions will uh, become in the future. Probably for, uh, for the arts, for example, just as the DPS mentioned, uh, it will be uh, challenging, but I think uh, at this moment we have uh, been able to cope with this very well. Many of the most important museums in the world are uh, offering their uh, uh, expositions for free in virtual tours and I actually personally have uh, the privilege of enjoying many of these expositions through these pandemics uh, because sometimes when you visit them uh, physically, you have one or two hours to visit those museums. Now that you have the possibility of entering and probably uh, going for lunch and coming back uh, uh, to continue with the uh, um, tour and uh, uh, probably uh, having uh, um, uh, some ballet or operas recorded that of course are not the same because the, the whole experience of going attending to to these places is uh, rather important but it will be a way of uh, uh, um, uh, finding new opportunities for these sort of, of, of professions and of course uh, uh, the um, the comment that EG posed about uh, uh, how to rethink of uh, the business uh, uh, um, structures that some companies have is also something that uh, it becomes an opportunity at this moment. I think uh, in the case for, for particularly in the airlines, they were always considering how to st uh, stick more people inside a plane instead of thinking what would be more safe for everyone inside a plane. Oh, yeah. So uh, now I think this would be an opportunity for all industries to think of, of the human beings that they're servicing rather than just making profits. Because uh, at, at the end, I think we all have seen and experienced how we can me be making money, but if there's no way to spend it, there's no use of uh, continuing yeah. doing these sort of activities. So that's my final remark. I think uh, I just uh, I thank you so much, everyone, for being here. I appreciate uh, uh, the presence of uh, Dr. Sunday, Dr. Manuel, and Dr. Martin, uh, because their uh, contributions were very enriching. Thank you. Thank you very much, Antonia Carlos. Uh, we've come to the end of the webinar. And on behalf of University of America, good luck. I want to appreciate all our participants for their patience and for their good questions and for their participation. I want to appreciate the organizer, uh, uh, Marisol. He has been up and doing, sending mail, coordinating us. I want to appreciate Professor Suarez, Professor thank Martins, you. Engineer Carlos. We have been having meeting upon meeting. I thank you all for making this a success. Uh, don't forget, we need a change. Thank you for your time and have a lovely day. Thank you. Thank you for everybody. Thank you very much. Thank you, everyone.